So today we're going to be taking a little bit of a different take on depression. As you all know, depression has become almost an epidemic in the modern world and we're seeing higher rates of depression and anxiety than ever before. This video today is meant to share that all this depression may not be coming from where you think it is. So before we get into it, I want to explain a bit about a cultural theory you may have studied before that will underpin this discussion. So we will start off by talking a bit about a collectivist cultures versus individualistic cultures. So in collectivist culture, we are looking at a culture where community is of great importance. In collectivist cultures, unity, harmony, loyalty, and selflessness are values that are held in high regard. Individuals living within a collectivist community are more attuned to sacrificing for the benefit of the larger whole, whether it be their family or community. Most of the world before the Industrial Revolution was operating from a collectivist point of view. Individualistic culture is focused on individuality, independence, and the rights and concerns of the individual. A person living within an individualist culture is more likely to advocate for their own personal well-being or desires. Individualistic culture is the culture that is predominating in the modern Western world. Very broadly, we can give the example that in many Latin American cultures, families are operating from a more collectivist culture. So we can see examples where it is a cultural norm for families to live in multi-generational homes with adult children living with their parents and grandparents up until they get married. And oftentimes we have all members of the family pitching in to pay for expenses of the family as a whole. Um, and on the other hand, we have the almost stereotypical American model of the nuclear family, which represents individualistic culture in this scheme. So mom and dad and children are living together, um, and as soon as the children are college-aged, they are going to be moving out to follow a career path or education of their own choosing and establishing their individual homes and finances. There is a lot more to get into here, but we're going to keep it simple for today. Most of what I'll be speaking about here when I refer to the modern culture is basically individualist culture. And due to globalization, most people who have a smartphone are going to be affected in some way by the ideas propagated by individualistic culture. With all that being said, I think now we can get into it. So the first factor of the modern world that is contributing to depression is the collapse of community or loneliness. I just saw a headline recently that read that the Surgeon General declared loneliness a worldwide epidemic. And I think this headline will probably resonate with most people. There have been many reports that loneliness is a major contributing factor to depression. So where is this loneliness coming from all of a sudden? What we are experiencing today is a breakdown of community. And while it has broken down to so many complicated factors related to technology, culture, education, politics, let's look at the practical examples of loneliness for the average American. So increasingly, we are seeing that individuals are becoming more and more isolated due to social media, smartphones, and while our communication is going up, our socialization and feelings of belonging are going down. Americans are living in bigger cities and towns where they don't know their neighbors' names. They're living hundreds of miles away from siblings and parents due to work or other reasons. And it even just feels that life has just become automated. In grocery stores, we are using self-checkouts or having our meals delivered and our shopping done all on Amazon with automated delivery sometimes. Our kids are busier than ever, building up impressive extracurriculars, but not hanging out with the neighborhood kids. And we're seeing the lowest attendance at houses of worship in recent years. Although life has become more streamlined and convenient, it comes at a cost. And that cost is the breakdown of the interdependence we used to experience in our communities. Because of modern conveniences, 
we no longer rely on each other in our everyday lives. We don't buy our bread from the baker every day. We don't deliver our milk from our Jersey cow to our neighbors anymore. And many Americans are going without the spiritual and religious communities that their ancestors took part in for generations. And this lack of community does affect our mental health. It's bad for us because it goes against our essential nature as humans. As humans, we need to feel a sense of belonging. When we look back at traditional cultures throughout time, we can see that almost all societies were structured in such a way that community members were truly interdependent on each other for goods and services in daily life. Your neighbors, your extended family, the local leaders, local clergy, they were a really big part of your daily life. I listened to a podcast a really long time ago where Helen Fisher was being interviewed and I'll find it and I'll link it below if I can find it. Um, so she made the point that couples today are more lonely than ever. And yes, I said couples, not individuals. Um, so Helen explained that couples these days are truly going without the support that their ancestors always had. They are living far away from their parents, they live in larger cities, they're relying on daycare, and don't have the extended community to rely on, which results in a lot of pressure being put on the two people to be everyone and everything for each other. And this can be a whole other topic. In our country today, a lot of depression is related to people's work. Other notable factors leading to depression are a feeling of meaninglessness or confusion about identity. So these three topics, finding the right vocation, having a feeling of meaninglessness, and identity confusion, these three are huge topics in and of themselves, but for today I'll speak about them as one categorical issue as they are related. People are really confused about who they are, what they want to do, and what they are meant to do. This fundamental confusion about one's identity lays an unstable ground for many people today. We have the idea in America that you can be anything you want. I personally have benefited from this, so I definitely have a level of appreciation for the American dream, but I also see that there are some drawbacks. In developmental psychology, I learned about this newer concept of extended adolescence. Researchers have found that in recent years, mostly starting around the early 2000s, the period of what was always considered adolescence to young adulthood has extended beyond the previous limit of around 19, as it was for decades, and now we're looking at it extending to about 30 years old. This extended adolescence is characterized about confusion about career, not settling down or getting married, delaying having a family or having children, and delaying buying property. There are many societal and economic factors leading to this, but I want to spotlight the confusion that young people have about where they fit in in society. Adding to the confusion, enter globalization via social media where our minds are flooded with images of other people's lives and identities. This invites a meditation on what is not ours. Oftentimes, the result of having a presence on social media means you will be seeing examples of other people's wealth and position, and maybe you'll be trying to emulate that. The details and daily routines of people with different opportunities or privileges than us is now on display. We have access to looking into the lives of others in a way that we never have before, and there are consequences to that. Comparing oneself to others will automatically cause some level of dissatisfaction. In ancient Vedic texts like the Bhagavad Purana, we read about the ideal society, which at a point in time did actually exist and still has remnants, although highly flawed and perverted, um, in places in India, the Middle East, and many places in Europe. And in this society, we have a system called Varnashram Dharma, which is a social system that divides society into four general categories of work and outlines the duties and responsibilities, as well as the privileges of each sector, as well as the duties of each phase of life. According to Varnashram Dharma, 
one would be born into a family and a certain sector of work, and their lifestyle would be pretty much laid out before them. There was a lot of clarity that they had about what their role in society was. So we can see that systems like this were still part of society up until not too long ago in the Western world, where it was the norm to continue in your family's business and take up their social roles in the local community. And social structures such as these, while of course not always perfect and restrictive at times, do provide a structure that helps one determine their role in society. While we can argue that many have benefited from having more opportunities and careers now that society has opened, we cannot deny that it also comes with complications. In the Bhagavad Gita, which was written 5,000 years ago, Krishna says, it is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, even though faultily, than another's duties perfectly. Destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties, for to follow in another, another's path is dangerous. Dangerous may sound a bit over the top at first, but we can use an example of a modern day college student. Attending college has become the norm in America, and while it presents career opportunities to individuals that likely wouldn't have had access in previous generations, it poses some other challenges. The social pressure to attend a four-year college has contributed to the decline of young people entering the trades. And let's think a bit about the individual consequences of this. If there is someone who is more equipped to the trades, working with their hands, fixing things, building things, they really enjoy it. It lights them up, it gives them a sense of purpose and accomplishment. Why do we feel so pressured to put this person in a university where their time will be spent in a classroom, writing papers, studying, taking coursework that they're not interested in? It may not sound overtly dangerous, but for this person, the risk will be higher for low self-confidence, frustration. This individual is not in a setting where they can thrive. And I think we would be surprised to find out how many young people are feeling this way. Being well situated in a role that provides oneself with meaning, accomplishment, and a sense of naturalness, this is something that really supports a healthy, happy life. And we're seeing today that it's become increasingly complicated for people to find their path. The third factor leading to depression in the modern world is a low vibration lifestyle. In the Vedic paradigm, we understand that the material world is made up of three modes of material nature. Goodness, passion, and darkness. Everything in this material world is made up of these three modes. For example, it's in the food we eat, how we dress, the way a room looks, the way we speak. Goodness, or in Sanskrit, sattva, is characterized by cleanliness, balance, harmony, positivity, peace, clarity, light, intelligence. Passion, or rajas, is characterized by movement, activity, excitement, desire, agitation, anxiety, and egotism. Darkness, or tamas, is characterized by inertia, inactivity, negativity, dullness, darkness, delusion, depression, and ignorance. What we're seeing today is that people are mostly unknowingly surrounding themselves in these lower modes, specifically tamas, darkness. We are associating with tamas in the forms of food that isn't freshly cooked, intoxicants, chaotic surroundings like a messy house, chaotic relationships where things are hidden, in our habits of procrastination, sleeping too much, too much television, too much scrolling. All of these things have a tamasic nature and the effects like depression, confusion, it'll, it will accumulate in our bodies and psyches. Just the way, for example, extra calories will accumulate on our physical form. It is just going to be there and you're going to have to work hard to get rid of it. And tamas or darkness is a very complex thing. It's not just that having your room clean, eating the cleanest diet, or waking up super early every day will guarantee that you're not inviting in the lower modes. Tamas can be subtle. 
Thomas is found in illusion or illusory ideas. So even if we may be doing everything right, but maybe we also have illusory ideas about who we are or what is happening in a situation in our life. Just that is enough to invite the negative effects of Tamagoon into our life. I saw a couple years ago an article about goblin mode <laughs> that came out in the pandemic. It was sort of a backlash, I think, to the that girl aesthetic, which I would brand as a higher vibe lifestyle consisting mostly of passion and goodness. The people behind the goblin mode movement are actively embracing the lower modes, relishing their unbalanced diets of un unhealthy foods, Netflix binges, disorganized spaces, and mismatched socks. What we don't realize is that surrounding yourself with these low vibrations is taking a serious toll on our mental health. While Tamagoon has existed throughout time, I would argue that today we feel more apt to embrace it and have less systems in place to uplift us to a standard of goodness. Thank you so much for watching and I'd love to see you in the comments. What are your ideas about the modern world's effect on our mental health? And again, if you're interested in more content like this, please subscribe. I have a lot more videos planned that I'd really love to share with you. All right, bye. <laughs>